Do you have a paranormal encounter you'd like to share with us? Send us an email with your story for a chance of it being featured on Weird World. The circumstances of James Murray's experience were still as vivid as if they had taken place only yesterday, but 20 years had gone by since that night. It was near the end of the grouse season, and he had been out all day with his gun, having had no sport to speak of. It was December, on a bleak, wide moor in the far north of England, and he had lost his way. There was a coming snowstorm as the leaden evening closed in all around him. As he continued trudging, he thought of his wife, who had implored him to return before dusk, and he had promised her that he would. They had been married only four months, and she would be suffering at his absence, as he became wearier and increasingly uneasy. His shouts for help seemed only to make the silence deeper. Then, what seemed to be an echo joined with a wavering speck of light which grew nearer and brighter. Running towards it at great speed, to his great joy, he came face to face with an old man and a lantern. The sullen man told him that he was a good twenty miles from Dwalding, but objected when James proposed that he provide him with shelter and sustenance in the storm. The master would not let him in. James followed his reluctant guide as he hobbled, gnome-like, away in the falling snow. Eventually, a large mass loomed up out of the darkness. The man opened the heavily studded door of the house, and James determinedly pushed past him into the house. To his surprise, the great rafted hall held not only agricultural implements and stored food, but a huge telescope. With a malicious grin, the old man pointed to a low black door at the opposite end of the hall, where James rapped loudly, then entered without waiting for an invitation. A huge white-haired old man rose from a table covered with books and papers and sternly asked who he was and what he wanted. James introduced himself as James Murray, barrister at law, and requested food and shelter. There was an altercation about James having forced his way into the house, to which he pleaded self-preservation, given the already thick and increasing layer of snow. The man looked out the window and agreed to James staying until morning if he chose. After the meal, he proceeded to ask James about what was happening in the outer world, as he was the first stranger who had crossed his threshold for more than four years. After a long conversation about science and philosophy, during which James felt that he had learned more than he had told, the man again looked out the window. It had ceased snowing. However, James still felt hopeless about reaching his wife in Dwalding that night. Even if he could find his way across the moor, he could not walk twenty miles that night. She did not know that he had lost his way and was probably breaking her heart with suspense and terror. With a smile, his host offered a solution. The night mail from the north, which changes horses at Dwalding, passed within five miles of that spot and would be due at a certain crossroad within an hour and a quarter. If his servant Jacob could guide him across the moor and put him into the old coach road, he could find his way there. Thanking the man for his hospitality, James happily set out with Jacob straight away. After some minutes of trudging in the bitter cold, they reached the old coach road, and Jacob informed him that it was another three miles to the crossroads. When James pulled out his purse, he became more communicative, warning him to mind the broken parapet near the signpost, which had not been fixed since the accident. One evening, nine years ago, the night mail had pitched right over into the valley below, a good fifty feet and more. Four lives were lost, and another two died the next day. After handing Jacob half a crown, James was able to walk fast along a line of stone fence, while it seemed to become colder, his feet like ice. He lost sensation in his hands and was breathing with such difficulty that he was forced to stop and lean against the fence. 
As he looked back up the road, he saw to his relief the approaching carriage lamps of some vehicle. Although it seemed strange that any private vehicle should take a road so disused and dangerous. As the dark outline of the lofty carriage became more visible, he wondered if he had passed the crossroads without observing the signpost, and if this was the very coach he had come to meet. The coach answered his question, emerging around the bend of the road, showing guard and driver, with one passenger on the outside, four steaming horses and lamps blazing. James jumped forward, waved his hat and shouted, and for a terrible moment feared that he had not been seen or heard. However, the coachman pulled up, James opened the carriage door and looked in. There were but three travellers inside, and so he stepped in, shut the door, slipped into the vacant corner, and congratulated himself on his good fortune. The atmosphere of the coach seemed, if possible, colder than that of the outer air and was pervaded by a very damp and disagreeable smell. James' three fellow passengers were all men and all silent. They did not seem asleep, but each leaned back in his corner of the vehicle as if self-absorbed. James attempted to open a conversation about the weather. One man lifted his head and looked at him, but made no reply. In the dim light, James saw that his eyes remained full on him, and yet he answered never a word. James was feeling chilled to his very marrow, and the strange smell inside the coach was affecting him with an intolerable nausea. Turning to his left-hand neighbour, he asked him if he had any objection to an open window. He neither spoke nor stirred. James repeated the question somewhat more loudly, with the same result. Then he lost patience and let the sash down. As he did so, the leather strap broke in his hand, and he observed that the glass was covered with a thick coat of mildew, the apparent accumulation of years. He began to examine the coach more closely, and saw, by the uncertain light of the outer lamps, that it was in the last stage of dilapidation, not only out of repair, but in a condition of decay. The sashes splintered at a touch, the leather fittings were encrusted with mould and rotting from the woodwork, and the floor was almost breaking away under his feet. The whole carriage was foul with damp, as if it had been mouldering away for years in some outhouse. James now turned to the third passenger and commented on the deplorable condition of the coach. He moved his head slowly and looked James in the face without speaking a word, a look that James would never forget while he lived. James turned cold at heart under it, and would whenever he recalled it. The passenger's eyes glowed with a fiery, unnatural luster. His face was filled with rage, his bloodless lips drawn back as if in the agony of death, showing the gleaming teeth between. James' words died on his lips, and a terrible horror came upon him. By now, his sight had become used to the gloom of the coach, and he could see with tolerable distinctness. He saw that his opposite neighbour had the same startling pallor in his face, the same stony glitter in his eyes. He realised that none of the passengers were living men like himself. A pale phosphorescent light, the light of putrefaction, played upon their awful faces, upon their hair, dank with the dews of the grave, their clothes, earth-stained and dropping to pieces, their gaunt hands. Only their terrible eyes were living, and their eyes were all turned menacingly upon him. A shriek of terror, a wild, unintelligible cry for help and mercy, burst from his lips as he flung himself against the door and strove in vain to open it. In that single instant, James saw in the moonlight the ghastly signpost rearing its warning finger by the wayside, the broken parapet, the plunging horses, the black gulf below. The coach reeled like a ship at sea, then came a mighty crash, a sense of crushing pain, then darkness. 
It seemed like years later that James awoke one morning from a deep sleep and found his wife watching by his bedside. With tears of thanksgiving, she told him what had happened. He had fallen over a precipice close to the junction of the old coach road and the new, and had only been saved from certain death by landing on a deep snowdrift at the foot of the rock beneath. He was discovered at daybreak by two shepherds who had carried him to the nearest shelter and brought a surgeon to his aid. The letters in his pocketbook had shown his name and address, and his wife summoned to nurse him, finally out of danger. The place of his fall was precisely that where a frightful accident had happened to the North Mail, nine years before. James never told his wife of those fearful events, and the surgeon treated his account as a mere dream born of the fever in his brain. But James always knew that, twenty years ago, he was the fourth passenger in that phantom coach.